Chapter 13 Saud, son of Abdul Aziz. If Abdul Aziz ibn Saud was the archetype of an Arab patriarchal chief adapted to the progress, if not the ways, of the mechanical West, his eldest son is yet another and different type. The nearest that I can get to a blanket description of Saudi Arabia's second king is to say that he could be the perfect example of the westernized, cosmopolitan eastern potentate familiar to English readers of fiction, only without the drawbacks. Unlike his father, he speaks a number of foreign languages with fluency and ease. His extensive overseas travels have given him the poise and diplomatic delicacy of what one imagines a perfect member of the aristocratic elite should be like. If you met this tall, somewhat burly, genial figure in any Western capital, it would at first be hard to picture him as the soldier, administrator, religious authority that he really is. Yet as we talked, I could sense the power behind those steel-rimmed glasses, the clear brain working steadily and without fanaticism, the power of judgment which he focused upon even the smallest matter under discussion. Saud, son of Abdulaziz, was a mature man, with his own strong personality, his own place in the administration of the country, long before the death of his father. His reputation had been won first in the tribal councils of the Wahhabis during the period of reconstruction of the country, secondly, and equally important, on the field of battle, where he had earned the name of sharer in the conquest of Hale and commander of tribal armies in various parts of the country. I went to see Emir Saud in his palace near Riyadh, not that anyone could in his wildest dreams have guessed where we were, had he been projected suddenly into the place. Leaving the forbidding walls of the capital behind, the car purred along the black, shiny ribbon of a macadamized road running like a sword cut through the wind-blown dunes. As we neared what appeared to be a lush oasis, I watched some of the toughest-looking men I have ever seen drilling to the barked commands of a military instructor. Halt! The wiry, green-capped figures froze as one man. Heat sprites danced in and out of their ranks. It seemed hotter here than the Hejaz itself. In the back row, with the other private soldiers, I noticed a Saudi prince. Now the oasis was looming closer. It turned out to be a sort of miniature forest, created, as I was told, entirely from the irrigation of a number of artesian wells which had been sunk all around it, and is situated three miles to the west of Riyadh. Through the screen of trees swept the car, up a gravel drive, and we were in an enormous landscaped garden, with all the familiar blooms of England ablaze in every colour of the spectrum. As we dismounted, the horticulturalist came forward, saluted, and spoke to me in Hindustani. He was an expert imported by Emir Saud for creating this garden in the wilderness. Saud was sitting in the central chair of a long row which formed his court, drawn up facing one side of an immense artificial lake. As we shook hands, he beamed like a rich uncle and motioned me to the seat on his right. The other huge gilt chairs were occupied by various Saudi officials, chiefs and guests. Prominent among them was Arabia's financial wizard, Sheikh Abdullah Suleiman of Anaza. The man who is now king of Saudi Arabia soon showed that he has a quality unusual in military leaders. He was completely sure of himself, relaxed, calm, almost nonchalant. Every man present listened to the jokes and light-hearted, smiling talk of Saud. Everyone knew that here was a man who could outride, outshoot, outthink and outfight any of them. He had proved it time and again and could repeat the process at will. Yet for all that, no single look of calculating thought, no sign of arrogance, no manifestation of anything other than open-minded benignity ever showed itself. He talked of many things, of the culture of Europe and its derivations from Arab civilization in Spain. He knew about the effects of the atom bomb, 
of the problems of overpopulation and social security which various communities and countries were facing. He outlined part of the policy of Saudi Arabia in relation to her friends and other Muslim lands. He spoke well of Sir Winston and of the Afghan king, my own monarch. As the conversation turned to horses, King Saud ordered that some should be brought from his stable and paraded before us in order to illustrate various finer points from life. Looking up and down the row of listeners, being myself one who has sat through many a discourse of Eastern chiefs, I never once detected any of the small signs which tell an observer that here was an experience merely being endured for an ulterior motive. On most subjects, Saud held us by the force, charm and sheer penetration of his words. You might liken it to a speaker who has the feel of his audience and who knows just what to say and when to say it. Saud speaks the most delightfully idiomatic English, too. Sometimes, when he was talking of things essentially British, he would turn to me, and as he spoke, I could easily picture him as an Oxford tutor, with that precise, contained and unaffected phraseology that I once revelled in at many an Oxford occasion. Another thing that seems to mark Arabia's new king is his retentive memory. If I spoke of the new quarantine arrangements at Jeddah, he would reply with a bewildering detailed review of the problems and developments there. When I mentioned camels, he gave me one of the most absorbing periods of my life in describing the types, colours, sizes and breeds. Then he went on to recount classical instances of the endurance and outstanding qualities of the animal. Saud wound up by touching on the strains and his own experience in producing various types for different occupations. The camel will never die out. It may be replaced in some spheres by a more efficient machine, but what machine gives you milk, meat, clothing, transport and companionship, and just for the cost of a little hay and water? Besides, when conditions change, you adapt your motor vehicle or other machine to the new tasks. One can do the same with the camel, by breeding. Breeding is the key to many things, and it is as well not to take up too dogmatic a view against it. It has its place. The trouble with too many people is this tendency to be unilateral about things. Look at the camel critically by all means, but look at him constructively as well, and not only at the camel. I was fascinated to see the way in which this desert prince, with all the knowledge of the West behind him, took every opportunity of putting a lesson and an illustration into what might seem at first an irrelevant topic. As the evening came, a Wahhabi elder, dressed in the simple brown robe and austere black headband of the brethren, rose from his place, went to the edge of the pool, and called the summons to the sunset prayer. Saud rose. Will you pray with us? Now the Wahhabis, as I have mentioned before, are probably the most reserved of all the persuasions of Islam. No Wahhabi drinks alcohol, smokes tobacco or anything else, takes any stimulant, listens to music or wears silk. All ostentation is utterly banned. Minarets and domes on the mosques are not encouraged. Photography and picture-making come under the ban as well. We washed our hands, faces and feet at a special fountain and walked to the other side of the lake to stand behind the prayer leader. The Wahhabis, like other Muslims, do not have any priesthood, and anyone most conversant with the Quran who is available at any given moment leads the prayer. On this occasion we formed ourselves up, grooms, servants, princes and guests, in several parallel rows facing Mecca, as the grey-bearded doctor of law recited a passage from the Quran. At prayer all are considered equal, and Saud stood in the middle of my row. This recitation, even, was of some interest to me. Instead of the melodious wavering chant of more liberal Muslims, the Wahhabis declaim the rhymed verses of the Arabic Quran without the slightest deviation from the normal reading. Anything else than a straightforward rendering would be considered something akin to music, and that is bida, innovation, of which all Wahhabis take a very dim view indeed. 
In some Middle Eastern countries, assassins consider the moment of prayer to be best for striking at their victim. Here, absorbed in his devotions, unarmed and off guard, he is an easy prey. For this reason, kings and other important personages frequently pray with an armed guard standing in front and behind, but not Saud, son of Abdul Aziz. The very fact of his fearlessness could be a strong deterrent to a would-be assassin. After prayers, we entered the actual palace of Badia to see some of the priceless eastern and western art treasures which Emir Saud had collected during his journeys, or as presents. Room after room contained weapons, hunting trophies, arms and armour of the period of Islamic greatness. All were decorated in simple but perfect taste, and the value of the Persian carpets alone must have been nearly incalculable. But the apartment occupied by the son of the desert was simple in the extreme. In one corner of an airy room was a radio set, a bureau and an easy chair. A carpet of good but not lavish design covered the floor. There were no pictures, no representation of the human or animal form. It was the mosaic law, carried on by Islam, against graven images. The palace itself was not erected in any mean proportions. It seemed to me to be entirely self-contained. An electric plant provided power for lighting, refrigeration, water pumping and the rest. Garages and stables were all separate from the huge white building, but within very easy reach. The flat roof was delicately covered with Persian-patterned wooden screens to trap the wind and deflect it throughout the palace. I considered that it would be an abuse of hospitality to ask for photographs to be taken, either here or in the audience with Saud's father. After all, Mecca was one thing, and there I took my chance of being caught. But here I would have to ask and the asking of something which is known to be against Wahhabi beliefs, well, that might be excused an infidel, but would not be expected of me. So my camera remained in its case. I had no chance to be alone and hence snatch a picture of the palace or garden. That was that. It was now time for dinner. I wondered whether it was to be another of the marathon feasts, sometimes lasting all night, that seemed common in the south. But no. The table, at which about a hundred and fifty people sat, was placed on a lawn under the cool shade of palm trees. At intervals along the grass stood electric standard lamps. The meal was entirely in European style, though with many extras in the form of side dishes of Arab and Turkish origin. During ordinary Arab meals it is not polite to talk at all. Prince Saud, when dining in Western fashion, however, kept the conversation going with verve and enthusiasm in three or four languages. We had delightful celery soup, fish, pilau with chunks of lamb amid the folds of saffron-tinted rice, which the Arabs know as roz bakhari, or bakharan rice, and which I identified as the Pathan national dish. There were all manner of green vegetables, pickled in salad form, and cooked as side dishes. When the chickens were brought in, the emir intimated that each man was expected to eat three chickens, and those who considered themselves weaklings and not fit to be soldiers had better stand up and ask to be excused that number. A German medical specialist who sat in front of me, he had just flown over to examine the prince, misunderstood, stood up for a toast, and was playfully pushed back into his seat by the overjoyed Saud. Like most Arabs, there is nothing he enjoys more than a joke. Saud is so very much like a younger edition of his father, Abdul Aziz, that I could well understand Churchill's reputed remark during his wartime meeting with them that he could scarcely tell the two apart. In size, bearing and features, there seemed to be hardly any difference at all. Sitting there in the garden, the soft Arabian darkness closing in on the low-powered electric bulbs, the resemblance seemed even stronger. There was quite a debate over the book that I was going to write about this trip. Someone said that I should not omit any detail of the modern progress of the Saudi land. Another felt that a fitting subject would be the growth of the country with direct reference to the king himself. All seemed well-versed in the vast number of travel books dealing with the Arabs, 
which had appeared in Europe and America between the wars and afterwards. One thing particularly noticeable about the feeling on that occasion was that, on the whole, the Saudis seemed to feel that they had not been very well done by in contemporary literature. Travellers who write with such authority about Arabia and Arabs seldom visit Saudi Arabia, the real Arabia, said one. They may go to Arabized areas like Syria, Iraq, Jordan, and then merely relate what the taxi driver said to them, or fill page after page with descriptions of life and wanderings, which do not seem to picture much more than the fringes of Arabia. I pointed out that, except for Muslims, nobody was really free to wander around the country. Apart from Jeddah, where almost anyone could go if he had a visa, Arabia is virtually a closed country today. Sinjin Philby, the English Muslim writer, had published a good deal and was writing more. There seemed no way out since there was no likelihood that Saudi Arabia would ever be generally open to travellers. Saud felt that, this being the case, travel writers should make it clear that they were usually not writing about the true Arabia as a whole, but about the countries of Arab civilization which bordered it. I must add here that I am positive that he did not mean this statement to be anything more than a clarification of the situation. He never showed the slightest hostility towards the neighbouring Arabized lands, very much the contrary. It is in your hands, then, he said, turning to me. You have been in the Hejaz and Nejd. Let us see what you can produce. I imagine that as a writer you will have a problem to know not what country to deal with, but how to treat the subject. This impressive experience seemed a fitting climax to the excitement of the pilgrimage. Now the Sudan beckoned, Mahdism, the domes of Omdurman.